Stratting starting. There we go. Starting. We are starting. We are starting. And now we have, and we are here. And I don't know what's happening over here. I'm trying to block it all out. There's a child here. I'm going to do a show, though. It's going to be awesome. We're ready to start this in three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 739, recorded on Wednesday, September 18th, 2019. Unintended Consequences. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, I'm going to, we are going to fill your heads with upright apes, rat games, and oops, mosquitoes. But first, disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Every once in a while, things do not go quite as you expected they might. An election goes the other way. You lose your job without notice. You fall off your bike and need stitches which might make the unexpected seem like a very terrible thing. However, the unexpected can also be a source of really positive things, like falling in love, finding a 20 in the pocket of a jacket you haven't worn in some time, or detecting the background cosmic radiation, residual proof of the Big Bang, despite never having heard of it before, as happened at Bell Labs, Homedale Horn Antenna in 1964. The unexpected, comes in many forms. If it didn't, it could hardly keep on being unexpected. Eventually, someone would catch on to it. And occasionally, they do. The story of science is the story of people catching on. If the story uh, we can't, and it's the story we can't get enough of here, we're having expectations of hearing the unexpected is just what you can expect on each week's episode of This Week in Science. Coming up next. Big kind of mind that can't get enough I want to learn everything I want to fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I want to know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science Good and a good science i was muted that whole time that's good and a good science to you too justin blair and everyone out there welcome to another episode of this week in science we are back again as you know we like to do talk about the science we've got science news coming amazingly out of our amazingly ears. there was more science this week again, again we keep thinking we will have gotten to the end of this show at some point by having that was it that was they're done putting nope. out science story. No, it keeps coming it there's just no keeps end coming. there's no end and uh, i mean there will be an end to our show eventually but you know it's still a ways off because we have a bunch of stories to get to we yeah. have stories about a dimming star i have a story about unintended consequences that people are talking about and asteroids what do you have, Justin? I have got 10 million year old upright apes, ever more ancient Neanderthals, and robots of the late Neolithic. What? What? Yeah. That doesn't make any sense That's at all. Story. It's coming. Oh, okay. Everybody. And Blair, the animal corner. Oh, my goodness. I have painful asps, playful rats, and smelly cats. <laughs> ah ah this sounds like a nursery school or beginning reader book the Painful. worst one ever ever <laughs> <laughs> oh it'll be so great everyone i hope you're looking forward to this show as much as i am let's have a fantastic voyage a fantastic voyage through the science before we jump in, I would love to remind you that if you are not yet subscribed to our podcast, you can find us all places that podcasts are found. 
Just look for This Week in Science. You can also find us on YouTube and Facebook and at our website, twist, T-W-I-S dot O-R-G, twist dot org. All right, let's jump into the science. To the moon. Want to go to the moon? Should we talk about the moon? Oh, no, that's not what I was going to talk about first. No, we're talking oh, about a star. That's what I'm talking about first. Mm. Bit farther out. Talk- mm-hmm. A bit farther out. Yeah, and this one's not even our own star. It's a star that you may recall us talk having talked about previously, known as Boyajian star. Oh, remember that one? I did not remember oh, this one. What is do you this? remember Tabby's star, maybe? Mm-hmm. Tabby sense. I remember that one. Yeah. All right. So Tabby star is a star found by astronomer Tabitha Boyajian. And this star, as we've talked about previously on the show, has some really interesting qualities about the way that we observe it. So the the interesting thing, people were wondering, why is it dim? It It's almost like a pulsar because with the light dims a little bit, but it's not a pulsar at all. It's just a normal star. Kind of small, too. And this star occasionally just loses a lot of its luminosity, and nobody really knows why. At one point, it dimmed about 22%, which is an incredibly significant amount. And people were coming up with hypotheses about maybe it's an alien megastructure that's being built, a Dyson sphere being built to harvest energy off the star. Great idea. Not correct. Uh, Some other ideas have also uh, seen the light of day, like a bunch of comets that are in orbit around the star. And now there's a brand new idea out on the block. And this one, I think, is very interesting in that it posits that maybe the dimming of the star is from the vaporization of an exoplanet, exomoon, comet thing. Let me clarify. So I say exoplanet, exomoon first, because around this star, there could be a couple of exoplanets. Now, the gravitational orbital dynamics of these bodies will, if there are a couple of them, these planets will get into a little uh, asymmetrical orbit. They'll get uh, not exactly spherical, and they may come in close to the sun and come or that the star tabby star and in coming in close to that star the star's gravitational pull if that exoplanet has a little moon can possibly kind of grab the exomoon from the exoplanet so that the exomoon ends up in orbit all by itself around the star and so that exoplanet kind of then turns into i mean the exomoon then turns into a little mini exoplanet But then that could last for a little while and orbital dynamics do what they will. And then the moon gets further grabbed by the star's gravitational pull, gets sucked in a little bit further. And in getting sucked in a little bit further, heats up. And as the moon heats up, maybe it starts to give off a bunch of ice and dust and it starts to vaporize. Big chunks come off of it, too. So this thing is just (laughs) falling apart all over the place. But in its orbit, in its movement around the star, it's like a comet. It's got probably got a tail. It's spewing this dust, this gas, this ice, big chunks and those things can leave a trail. And so that trail could end up being a very irregular ring, orbital ring, the leftovers of this moon as it disintegrates, as it's being pulled into the star and is orbiting the star. And that's what they think potentially could be creating the dimming of Tabby's star. And they think that it is something that is fairly common and could be seen multiple places around the universe. Lots of stars with, and there have been other stars uh, that have been, that we've looked at that have seen, seem to have some amount of dimming to them, not to the same extent 
as Tabby Star, not quite as extreme as this particular example, but still, this could be a very common phenomenon. So exoplanet becomes exomoon, becomes comet, <laughs> becomes ring of dust and detritus around the star that blocks the star's light. Ta-da! But we don't know for sure wow. because we still have mm. to go there. Yeah. <laughs> There's still a lot more to be seen. Yeah. But the thing I love about Tabby Star is that it has inspired so many people to, I guess, imagine and kind of look at the at the, the star and try and figure things out. And has, it has provoked a lot of conversations. What's out there? Well, what and, and nothing's there? static. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's all these things constantly changing. Chances are anything you think of that is possible, according to physics, is happening somewhere in the universe right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, so there yeah. you go. And <laughs> why not? That, why not some vaporized comics? Yeah. Things that we haven't even considered yet are definitely happening. Right. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Vaporized moon. Ta da. And let's move from vaporized moons to, oops, mosquitoes. Oops. Mosqu oops, mosquitoes. Oops, That's what I'm mosquitoes. That's what I'm naming them. They're the oops, mosquitoes. Oh. All right. Let, so okay, let me, let's, uh, okay, so if. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Ah, mosquitoes. <laughs> ah, mosquitoes. I'm aware. I'm familiar with. What well, is but it then also mosquito? pollinators that are ooh mosquitoes. Ooh mosquitoes. <laughs> but now we have oops. What is an oops yes. mosquito? An oops mosquito. An oops mosquito is a genetically modified mosquito uh, who was released into the wild by people doing an experiment to try and reduce mosquito populations in areas of the world where dengue and Zika are prevalent and causing big problems. And instead of just reducing the populations by um, leading to uh, unsterile females, that it, it, uh, there were a few that survived, and now there are um, mosquitoes in the natural population that have been found containing genetic material from the genetically modified mosquitoes that were released from the lab. Oops! Mosquitoes. Is this what I do my told you so dance? Because I feel like this is exactly what I said was going to happen. Okay, okay. But, but is this. But I is, have lots of things to say. Yes. Yeah, Go ahead. Well, ask what a is question. The, what's the result of this oops? Yeah. So uh, the positive result of this oops is this is an experiment that has been uh, that the researchers, a. An, a let me see if I can get my notes here. The, the company named Oxitec has been working on for about a decade. And in their strategy, what they do is they have these genetically modified mosquitoes that basically they release males that mate with females and then there are no viable offspring that are supposed to come from that. The Oxitec uh, representatives who have spoken with uh, Nature Research, they've said that in the lab, about 3% of the offspring do survive. And he said that they have been very, very, very clear that there is a very small percentage of survival in their laboratory populations. As we've talked about on the show before, the world is not the lab. And so they released them into the wild, and it was successful. They saw mosquito populations drop by about 90%. So areas that just clouds of mosquitoes, and they're having significant problems with uh, mosquito-vectored disease, it, it, it really has the potential to make a difference. These neighborhoods where they uh, did these trials, it worked. It really massively, like by 90, in one of the trials, uh, not in Brazil, but in another location, um, it caused, no, in Brazil, this is when they, it, it caused local populations to dip by as much as 96%. So this is an incredibly successful trial that Oxitec carried out. 
another researcher wanted to know what was going to happen to these, uh, the offspring that survive, right? How are they going to fare? The researchers from Oxitec said, hey, the 3%, they're all sickly, and they probably don't go on to mate and survive and do very well. They probably just die off. They're probably not going to do well at all. Well, turns out from sampling the native populations in the latest Oxitec trial that while the genes for sterility this protein that they have uh, targeted in their in their technique, while that is not the the gene, this modified gene is not the one that is being transferred to the natural wild populations. They did find sequences of the genome from the laboratory mosquitoes in the native populations. So it means they are mating whatever percent is surviving are mating, and they're doing so successfully. Uh, the paper that's out right now, though, the question is whether it, 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 the conclusions the paper raises have now been flagged because it, it's, it's thought that maybe there's not enough evidence behind them for the conclusions that they reached, which is that these natural populations now with the gene modified population gene sequences it, bits of genome in them that maybe they will go on to be better survivors than the regular mosquitoes ever were but they don't know that they haven't done any of those tests they don't know these things and and the genes for sterility were not the ones that got transferred they're just regular mosquito genes huh just from the lab population. So the, 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 the paper that's out right now this week is like, hey, it increased the diversity in the genome. This is going to make them better at competing. And so probably, you know, master race mosquitoes are coming soon to mm -hmm. Brazil. But yeah. yeah, Blair, you look like you have comments. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just I told you so. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> I just feel this is. I recognize we can't keep everything exactly as it was or is. I recognize that. I recognize that there's lots of good to be done in experimentation and adaptation to current concerns. And mosquitoes are a huge worldwide health concern. I yes. get all of that. However, it this is exactly the thing that you need to study very carefully before releasing genetically modified mosquitoes into the wild. Whoa, 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 when, whoa, 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 whoa. Adjust... Who really, there was no releasing of. Yeah, this was an was. escape. No, this was a release. They, this was an intentional? This was intentional. They drove vans through the streets of oh, these I didn't, no, towns I missed this. I missed releasing this. I clouds they, I of... this was an escape. <laughs> the survival okay. was the oops. Yeah. But the survival yes. is the oops. Yes. The, okay. sur the fact that there were survivors that so, went on to spread their DNA in the, in the wild populations. Oops. So A, assuming that the ones that survived are probably going to die anyway. Mistake. B, <laughs> not testing what else happens when the mosquitoes you're trying to sterilize continue to mate. So even the ones that they're like, oh, these will probably die anyway. You should yeah, still get them to mate before they supposedly die or whatever, to see what happens to their offspring. You don't know. There could be a genetic linked trait that you're accidentally putting in there that makes them more deadly. You don't know. <laughs> like, there's so many things. Well, before I, I you mean, just go driving a van out of mosquitoes to just... Yeah. There needs I, to be more due diligence. That's all I'm saying. There was not I suppose. I suppose. I, I, don't, I don't know, though, that there is any... Uh, any more virulence than uh, picking up uh, and becoming a uh, picking up something and becoming a vector. And but but you could become a more effective vector. Not well, all mosquitoes I, I carry think... disease, and some of them yeah. are more genetically predisposed to carry. But so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's so about... you could accidentally be turning up the frequency of the predisposition to being a good vector. I mean, accidentally you could. Do, yeah, I, that's do what I'm saying. Is, there's accidentally like, you could do anything. Done here. Uh, you can even accidentally when you mess with the genome, you can accidentally do all sorts of things. Yeah, but it's it's harder to do things accidentally than it is to do them intentionally. And I think that's probably the 
I'm just saying when you when you make a new feature on a car, you smash it into a wall thousands of times no, to make don't. sure it's not thousands of it's times. It's not it's like a couple times. <laughs> but you test but still, it. That's yeah. and I that's all I'm saying. Just smash it into a wall a few times. Double check before you go releasing stuff. Yeah, I mean, the the thing is that I keep coming back to here. I mean, there could have there could have been more of the um, fertility aspect. How do these how do these genetically modified survivor offspring reproduce in the lab? They could have done that. Maybe they mm -hmm. could have done some control experiments in controlled situations that are more naturalistic. You know, than than actual release into the wild. Um, but the thing it comes down to here is that these genes that we're mixed into that are the GMO genes that you'd be worried about, that they are not being transferred. They're mm -hmm. not the ones that are mixing with the with the native D uh, DNA. This is all 80s Egypti. All of the, the mosquitoes from Oxitex lab were 80s Egypti. All of the mosquitoes in the populations, they're 80s Egypti. They're just... Brazilian 80s Egypti versus the lab strain, which is a mix of Cuban and Mexican 80s Egypti. Right, which Egypti. is also so, not awesome, so, but yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so they're the same. They're the same species, but they're from different strains of the insects, and so there are potentially behavioral differences, phenotypic dif phenotypic differences. But overall, this is the same species, so. What are we worried about, really, at well, this point? To your the, the experiment, point, the experiment decreased mosquitoes right. by ninety percent. Yeah, no, and and that is, I think, that's definitely potentially a good thing. But um, the the problem there is what you mentioned before is that bringing in the same genus species but different from a different area can improve genetic diversity, which can make them healthier. <laughs> Yeah, right. it can, but mm -hmm. uh, more likely, it, it, well, uh, yeah, uh, equally as likely, I suppose. Diversity is good. So diversity isn't always good. Uh, so diversity Genetic diversity is, is one of the pillars well, of a healthy on a but, population. But I, mean, uh, well, I mean, getting, okay, but gaining a genetic uh, background that was the, built in a different environment might make you uh, completely weakened in a new environment where those same things, in same environmental things you can't encounter. Well, that would oh, be wiped out again, within a few generations. In right, this case, climate then, change, humans, all these to, other things. As opposed to like uh, the king toads in Australia, which is like, oh, we don't have predators that would normally keep our population down and so we can proliferate. So it's either, it's a, a, you can either uh, explode a niche or find yourself completely outmatched because you know natural defenses. Um, the experiment here, though, I mean, I, the mis I, I, the way I see vectoring of mosquitoes is is very much population based and very much their ability to hold a pathogen. So if you're addressing either one of those things, you should be decreasing that number. I don't feel like there is a way to increase it above, unless you go to a region that doesn't have pathogen uh gut uh clinging mosquitoes uh, and you add them into the mix if it if the pathogen if the if they're already being vectors i don't think that you have a, a real problem there yeah they're Chris, already vectors Chris. they could i mean they could make them worse vectors i mean you don't want like the ultimate strongest mosquito to come from these experiments we don't need you know african bees to come from our bee experiments, but that well, has and happened, you know, so talked, we don't want to do that with the that mosquitoes either. We've talked earlier on the show too about how um, there's specific pheromones or chemicals that you release that attract mosquitoes, right? And there's actually a potential that for people who are from a specific area, there could be some sort of evolutionary arms race where maybe they have their own defenses to the local mosquitoes. And if you bring in non-local mosquito strains, they could be better at uh, sniffing out the local people. There's all sorts of things yeah. that can happen <laughs> between humans and mosquitoes when you, um, when you kind of mix up, blur those lines. But 
Yeah. So, I mean, this is not the gene drive that we have discussed on uh, previous mm-hmm. episodes talking about mosquitoes and Why methods of methods of limiting yeah <laughs> this exactly <laughs> well yeah if, um, if, if it was 96 percent effective and then those babies of the four percent were also 96 percent effective then suddenly you'd have almost nothing left yeah. which would probably be right. you'd have enough that they could still pollinate and they, animals could still eat them it probably would be the end of the world yeah in this in this case i think what would end up happening since the gene drive technique would end up like permanently the idea is that it would permanently reduce the population that every successive generation you just have fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer because the gene for sterility just spreads and every everybody dies until the only the strong serves the most fecund survive um but the but this is not gene drive and so the it, there is control built into it if as long as these these genes the the genes that are modified i guess don't get out um these mosquitoes will have to be re re-released and re-released and re-released because it's a it's supposed to be a single generation thing you release the males they they're kind of you know the fake the fake maters the females think they've had had babies but none of the babies survive so everybody Everybody dies, the population's decreased. But then the population comes back again, and you have to do it all over again. So Oxitec, basically, they'll have a good, you know, they'll they'll have to be releasing, making and releasing mosquitoes over and over and, and over and, again. And there has been a real-world experiment uh, in this mm-hmm. already in the natural world, which is, uh, I believe it's South American mosquitoes moved to north uh, moved into north america and when they mated with north american mosquitoes the north american mosquitoes became uh sterile Uh, the females became sterile after mating and it basically wiped out the population except for a small maybe it's maybe it's four percent maybe it's the same uh roll of the dice here but a small portion of them uh that had mutations survived and sort of rebuilt but uh, mostly they were replaced um it didn't. Uh, this was something that just happened in the natural world. This wasn't a man-made thing that took place. This just happened. Uh, and you know, do you remember that? Do you notice that you're getting bitten by today's mosquitoes and not the same mosquitoes that bit your great grandparents? Probably not. Like people are no. still annoyed by mosquitoes. Um, ah, mosquitoes. Yeah. Exactly. Well, enough annoying mosquito talk. Justin, do you have a story? I probably do. Oh, good. Yes. Uh, I don't know if this is the story I intended to start out with, but this is uh, for 10 million years, fossilized ape Ruda Pithecus waited in Ruda Banya, Hungary, to add its story to the origins of how humans might have potentially evolved. Now, what is a what is an ape in Hungary got to do with human evolution? Well, the story it told, it told through its pelvis. Uh, Among the more informative bones in a skeleton, and then when you find a fossil of a pelvis, it can tell you quite a bit. An international team led by Carol Ward at the University of Missouri analyzed the pelvis and discovered that human-like bipedalism, that ability for hominins to walk around on two legs, might possibly have deeper ancestral origins than previously thought. So the Rudipithecus pelvis uh, was discovered by David Began, professor of anthropology, University of Toronto, who then invited Ward to collaborate to study the fossil. So Began's work on this uh, uh, Rudipithecus had been on limb bones, jaws, teeth, and it showed that Rudipithecus was a relative of modern African apes as well as humans which is surprising seeing as how it was found in uh, Hungary, right? This is not considered the origin point of hominins. But he didn't have a pelvis. Uh, I, actually, I assume... I, assume he, <laughs> I think, I hope he did. I, I, see, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's safe to assume that, uh, that David uh, Began had a pelvis, but he didn't have a pelvis of a rudipithecus. So the information on its posture, anything about locomotion... Uh, I've been pretty much a uh, blind spot. Uh, Quoty voice. This is of, of Ward. Uh, Rudipithecus was a pretty ape-like and probably moved 
among branches like apes do now, holding its body upright and climbing with its arms. Uh, Ward is a professor of pathology and anthem, uh, anthem, and, ah, uh, and, oh my, never mind. Anatomical sciences at the MU's, uh, MU School of Medicine. However, it would have differed from modern great apes by having a more flexible lower back which would mean that when Rudapithecus came down to the ground, it might have had the ability to stand upright more like humans do. The evidence supports the idea that rather than asking why human ancestors stood up from all fours, perhaps we should be asking why our ancestors never dropped down on all fours in the first place. So one of the things about modern African apes and their sort of knuckle-dragging uh, all down on all fours walking is that they have a long pelvis and a sh very short lower back. So they don't really have the flexibility required uh, to, to, to position themselves that way. It's not just that they're lazy. Humans have longer, more flexible lower backs, which allow them to stand upright, walk effectively on two legs, which is considered a hallmark characteristic of our human or hominin evolution. Ward says, if humans evolved from an African ape-like build body substantial changes to lengthen the lower back and shorten the pelvis would have been required if however humans evolved from an ancestor more like rudapithecus this transition would have been more straightforward now that's not saying that this specific european ape is a direct ancestor of mankind uh it's about the size of a medium dog it's kind of on the smallish side it would have also required a lot of other changes to have taken place. Uh, but uh, uh, this is, according to Ward, significant because our finding supports the idea suggested by other evidence that human ancestors might not have been built quite like modern African apes. So it's positing a, another sort of missing link uh, in the ape history of hominins. That's and, so and there cool. Was, and there was and there was apes in Hungary. Who knew? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, mean, it's it another wasn't. good reminder that we didn't come from current apes. We had a common ancestor. Yes. So when you think about your great 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 grandparents, you're not thinking about a bonobo. Mm. Thinking right. about something kind of in between the two. Yeah, it, it's fascinating to be able to find a specimen like this that it there's a different strategy. I think that's cool because we have had this idea, even though we've been, uh, you know, talking about the idea we you know have this straight line of human evolution, right? Apes to man, like you're talking about. Yeah. But we've been talking about the braided stream recently, and so it's just it. Yes, we more more samples, more more styles. Like we got to ground up, trees down. Which way did which way did it work best? And when did the ancestor of humans and apes break off from what later became monkeys, simians? And when did that common ancestor break off from what is prosimians, lemurs? Right. So like, there's mm -hmm. all these kind of does. Does that common ancestor look like a lemur or do lemurs look kind of different now? <laughs> so they, we make all these kind of guesses or educated guesses based on what things are common. But the modern monkey doesn't necessarily look much like the common ancestor that apes and monkeys have. Oh, right. So we yeah. always have to yeah. remember that everything is equally as evolved. <laughs> like we, yes. we all, If we all came from a, basically the same starting point. We've all had the same amount of time to change morphologically. Uh -huh. Right. So so we, we could have had a common ancestor that had a long flexible back and could have been standing upright. And then a lot of the current modern apes just decided, eh, we're going to really do something do else. Yeah, we're yeah. going to we're gonna lengthen the <laughs> pelvis. We're going to shorten the back. We're just yeah. going to, there's no point in standing upright. Right? That's totally right. Yeah, you could, yeah, you could, <laughs> hominins could have gone way back further. I think it's interesting, though, that this is a 10, 10 million year old species uh, that is out of Africa, uh, that is that is telegraphing that there was uh, the precursors of hominins 
already were starting to spread and were already starting to become and find themselves successful. And 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 it, it goes again to that, that that there is something about being a bipedal hominin that seems to lend itself to success on, on this planet. Yeah. yeah. Hungry. Who knew? Yeah. Hungry. Oh, wait, I'm not hungry. But it is time for Blair. Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. Want to hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a what you got, Blair? Oh my goodness. Well, I have a story that's actually perfect coming after that whole mosquito conversation that we were just having about unintended consequences. <laughs> um, this one is coming out of Rice University in Texas. Um, so this is actually looking at the Texas Medical Center, the TMC, so I'm told. Um, and there's lots of green spaces in the Texas Medical Center. There's lots of live oak trees that line the sidewalks in these green spaces in the Texas Medical Center. There's lots of college students there. There's people seeking treatment. There's people that are immunocompromised. But these um, about 10 million people go to Texas Medical Center every year and um, and use these green spaces. And um, they have done some things to make sure that these green spaces are accommodating. And one of them is trying to make sure that those pathways are not covered in bird poop. And the way you do that is you kick out the grackles and pigeons by putting nets um, around the trees. So that works really well. The pathways are now clear of bird poop, but something more nefarious has come in the shape of an asp. <laughs> Sorry to That's laugh. right. What? It is an asp. It's like a caterpillar. Um, so they are um, megalopods. Pygi opercularis. Please okay. don't send letters. <laughs> but this is uh, basically a, a caterpillar. Um, they have venomous spines. When you are stung by an asp, it can cause localized pain as bad as a broken bone and can Ow. last for hours it can oh take up goodness. to 10 minutes before the pain kicks in you might not realize you've been stung for that long it those uh besides the pain you can also get headaches nausea vomiting fever low blood blood pressure and inflammation of lymph nodes it can also create abdominal distress muscle spasms convulsions and respiratory stress not a fun time i've never heard of an asp before but now i will really try to stay away yeah. from them so they yeah. look kind of like teeny tiny clumps of hair or teeny tiny mustaches they trouble. look cute yeah trouble. and so i guess some people often do when they travel to texas for the first time they'll um see these cute caterpillars and go to pick one up oh, and get no. poked by a spine and get hurt um but What's happening in this case is that this asp, North America's most venomous caterpillar, wow. um, is coming out 7,300% more often than when the trees are not netted. Because the oh. birds eat the caterpillars and yeah. th there's no issues. Yes. So yeah. the world's most venomous, oh, North America's most venomous caterpillar, the concentration of these caterpillars, 7,300% higher on netted versus not netted trees. So this is an observational study just looking at the fact that they were noticing anecdotally there were lots of these little caterpillars on these trees where there was netting. So they removed some nets and then they just studied these trees, some netted, some not netted, um, and over a three-year span, a pretty good chunk of time. Um, and yeah, they found all of these extra asps. 
So, quote, when you don't take into account the natural interactions taking place within a community or ecosystem, even in an urban setting, it can cause dun 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 unforeseen consequences like a pain in the asp that's right they continue to say quote there's no bad guy here questionable quote urban bird pests are a real problem and birds can carry disease and both health risks too so that's a good reminder this isn't just um a cosmetic thing where they want to make sure that the pathways look nice. They also are trying to reduce the amount of potential uh, zoonotic disease and other things that the birds could bring to these immunocompromised people in these areas of healing. Um, So netting trees is a way to address that problem. But now they know that this is most likely leading to an increase in ASP stings. Um, And so this is a multi-dimensional problem that requires further Um, research. Additionally, right nearby TMC is the Houston Zoo, and um, they have over 6,000 animals from 900 different species, and many of those trees are also netted. Uh, So uh, now they're starting to wonder if there could be animals getting asp stings as well. Probably. Yes. Yeah. So there you go. I do wonder, though, I, I mean, we do know that there are migratory waterfowl, ber- poultry, you know, type birds, geese, ducks, mm-hmm. other things. That we, you know, we know that bird flu and other things can be an issue. But the majority of the time, what are we catching from birds that you need to make sure that they're not in the trees for? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good I. They just, they're saying that I feel like it's really cosmetic. I feel like they really uh, yeah. just don't want bird poop all over their pathways. But I, I mean, mean, it was nice. Nice try, everybody. Nice try to clean it up, but just hire somebody with a hose. Yeah, well, it's yeah. Texas. It's Texas. You have to remember, this is Texas. Once we kill all of the animals, life will be fine. Right. <laughs> this is, I think, their <laughs> philosophy down there. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So, well, although, although to be fair, there's a lot of poisonous animals in Texas. Like, I mean, there's some. Right. Well, maybe, maybe you know, you don't, you don't plant the trees so close to the pathway if you're worried about birds perching and pooping. Because also, let me just remind everyone Jeez. while we're talking about bird poop, that only seabirds poop while flying. All other birds, grackles, pigeons, the things that are talking about here, they have to be perched. perched to mm-hmm. poop. So if you just make sure you trim the trees so that there's no branches directly over pathways, no one will get pooped on. Oh, Blair, careful, careful. With this information, they're also going to get rid of all the trees. I mean, honestly, <laughs> at this point, that's what we're talking about. Encouraging the birds to pick mm. other trees without giving um, venomous asp habitat would maybe be better. <laughs> Are there even yeah. native trees in the state of Texas? Yes, I don't there know. are. I don't know. Oh my there goodness! Are. I think they're all important. Isn't Texas maybe. a giant desert wasteland? Maybe oh, all no. no, no, no. So maybe, you heard maybe. it here first, guys. Next ten twist live shows will be in Texas, so we can That's educate right. Justin. <laughs> the trees in Texas are just playing hide and seek from Justin. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. I feel like um, we're that's all, right. we're hide all and invasive. And seek. All the trees in Texas are invasive species. Hide and seek. Speaking of hide and seek, um, lots of children enjoy hide and seek and enjoy play in general. We know that play is an important part of developing cognitive abilities and social emotional skills in humans, but also in animals. And a recent study out of Germany looks at whether rats enjoy playing hide and seek. Not with each other. No, no, no. With humans. This study, I love it so much. It's so good. It made me giggle out loud when I read it. A group of neuroscientists in Germany spent several arduous weeks (laughs) playing hide and seek with rats. They took a small room. They filled it with boxes. And they really just did teach the rats how to play hide and seek. How do you know you're teaching the rat to play hide and seek and not to search and find in a training exercise? You don't give them food. So it is purely an enjoyment-based task. Um, So 
This is from Humboldt University of Berlin. They looked at adolescent ma male rats in a room of 30 square meters, and I will convert um, to 320 square feet. The scientists would either find a cardboard box to crouch behind uh, as they were hiding, and then the rat had to find them, or they'd give the rat a head start to find cover, and then the scientists would open their eyes and search. Now, I have played hide and seek with dogs before, and there is a really popular video circling around the internet right now of a little, it looked like a toy poodle or something that kind of hides behind a doorway and jumps out and surprises their owner and gets so <laughs> excited, kind of like jumps up and down when the owner acts surprised. So this is something that actually I feel like is really relevant to kind of the general viral internet stuff going on right now too. It's something that we can definitely relate to in that way. Um, but they found that over a period of a couple of weeks, they would start to kind of get really excited at the prospect of playing and when they were playing. They developed advanced strategies. They revisited spots humans had previously hidden in, or they chose to take an opaque rather than transparent box. Good one, Rat. Mm -hmm. um, and so the reward was not food or water. They just kind of played with them. Like um, they scratched them or um, playfully pushed them back and forth a little bit. And the rats would actually uh, jump up and down a little bit or even squeak um, in a playful way. And so we, we've talked on the show before about rat tickling. This is actually kind of related to that, too. Um, so they actually let out high-pitched giggles, quote-unquote, um, above the human audible range. They were able to record this and measure it. They would also create uh, joy jumps, which now I have to find there's a German word for it. And you know German words are always so good. Of course there's a so German good. word for it. Freudensprung. Ah. <laughs> Freud and sprung. Oh, I mean, that's my new favorite word. Freud and I, sprung. Joyful I, leaps. I do that when I see my friends. Yeah. They Freud and sprung. Yes, they Freud and sprung. Um, and so uh, when they were discovered, sometimes the rats would actually jump away and playfully rehide at a new location, kind of like peeking out several times, indicating they want to play again which is really interesting. Um, so the researchers feel pretty confident that this means, A, the rats were playing hide and seek and they understood that it was a game because they weren't taking a reward as of food or water or anything like that, but B, that they really did seem to find enjoyment from it. Um, and so what the kind of implications of this is, besides from just being such a fun story, is a reinforcement of the idea that play is a really important cognitive development tool for mammals in this case, but I'm sure if we looked further, it wouldn't just be mammals. And they took it one step further, kind of for the next step of the study, they attached microwires to the rat's head to record brain activity so that they could identify mm. which neurons were linked to specific game Because these events. are neuroscientists. Yes. So yes. from here, they will be able to use this data for future experiments. For example, to look at neural development when play activities are restricted. So how does a, a, a deficiency of playtime affect neuronal development? Which in this week in we have to do over all studies involving rodents of all time ever Yep. over again. Um, this is an example where if you're not playing with your lab rats, that could impede cognitive development. And that mm -hmm. could be a confounding variable on studies of intelligence or um, social emotional tests or social strategy. Well, depending on if they're isolated, if they are, if, if your rats are living in isolation. Yeah. I mean, since I was a graduate student, this bit has been a huge area of discussion uh, with the the concept of whether or not you need to give enrichment to mm -hmm. animals. Um, and there have been studies for a couple of decades now trying to look for neurogenesis. Uh, Rusty Gage is a, a researcher who works in this area looking for neurogenesis in the mouse and the rat brain. And I, I believe he has some studies where he 
found it, where they gave, they didn't have, they restricted enrichment or they enriched the environment. This isn't with play, but they either Mm -hmm. gave a completely sterile environment, which was this, (laughs) the typical, Mm -hmm. typical lab environment for these animals and their brains had had very vo- low levels of neurogenesis yeah, and uh, synaptic plasticity, and then when they were when blocks and things for them to interact with and other individuals were put into their uh, their cages, more brain activity, more neurogenesis, more plasticity, and so mm-hmm. yeah, this is something that we've been looking at for a long time. Um, and sure. if you're, but if you have, a, if you have your rats in individual cages, maybe yeah, maybe you should be playing with mm-hmm. your rats. <laughs> and and maybe if they're in spaces that don't allow for play, yeah, there there could be other rats in this space, but it's possible they don't have the yeah. right um, amount of space or the right tools or the right enrichment items to encourage play. Um, or it's possible that if they're all the exact same age, they don't know how to initiate play. There's lots of things at play haha, here that could um, could impact studies and specifically studies looking at intelligence or social. Social, impacts. especially, yeah. So, yeah. so one very anthropomorphizing thing I saw in the hide trial one that you were playing there, Kiki, mm-hmm. uh, the mouse goes and hides in the box and the human goes looking for it. And the human uh, might have known where the mouse was at this point, but walked by the box where the mouse was hiding. And the mouse like poked its head out and poked its head back in again. Like yeah. it was so excited, which is exactly <laughs> what happens when I play with little kids. With my kids, uh-huh. is that you get you, you get close to their hiding spot and they start giggling or they just get excited and like get themselves <laughs> away. They're like ah. <laughs> I, I would like was, the sound was, on on these videos. Like, is someone in German going like, "Uh oh, is that a rat back there? Are you back there? Oh, I don't think so. I'm gonna go check over here." It, was, it looked like it looked like uh, in excitement and uh, anticipation of being found, and the whole the like yeah. the way the game is played properly. Yeah. That was pretty cool. Yeah, and yeah. also just a real quick reminder that. If you're that kind of person, rats do actually make really good pets. <laughs> they don't live very long, but they make great pets. They're and amazing this is pets. Why? They're really yeah. smart. They're social. Yeah. It yeah, they're they're kind of unsung heroes of the animal world for a bunch of reasons. For their uh, their great contributions to medical science, but also they're they're pretty smart and social and yeah, yeah. Make it pet. makes me so sad when people are like, "Ee, a mouse! Ee, yeah. a rat!" I'm like, "Oh, yay! Yes. <laughs> They're so cool! <laughs> They're so cute and squeaky!" So now we know they giggle, and they play hide and seek, and they freudensprung, <laughs> and they freudensprung. Yes, mm-hmm. my new favorite word. Now I'm gonna. Now it's going to be the word that I say as I jump up and down in joy. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I hope you're Freudensprunging at this story and at the possibility of some more stories coming up in just a few moments. We're going to take a quick break. This is This Week in Science. Stick with us because we have more stories after this. I have asteroids in the second half, and I think we've got robots of the Neolithic from Justin? What? I don't know. I can't wait. I hope you can't either. We'll be back. Stay tuned. We can't explain the things you've heard with more than intuition. A line of reason shows the way you go. A hypothesis and patience are the only things I need. Put on a pair of goggles and go looking for the things I couldn't see. I hope you're enjoying this hour of This Week in Science. We are back here again to talk with you about... Well, I want to say thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Thank you for being a listener of This Week in Science. Thank you for watching us on YouTube, if that's where you are right now. Thank you so much for bringing us into your week. 
and allowing us to share science with you and curiosity. And we hope that you take some of that curiosity with you into the rest of the world. To keep this show going, we could really use your support. How about checking out our website? That's right. You can head over to twist.org. Twist.org is the Twist website where you can find all sorts of wonderful things, wonderful things that allow you to interact with us and also um, to support us. So first thing, there's a big orange subscribe button. If you have not subscribed yet, click on that. It'll take you to the big three, iTunes, Google, and YouTube and to the subscription mechanisms there to, for you to be able to pick one of those big three to subscribe. Like I have said previously, we are also on Spotify. We're on Spreaker. We're on TuneIn. We're on Pandora. We're on Radio.com. We're all sorts of places that podcasts are found, so you can find us all over the place, or you can tell friends where to find us. If they have questions, twist.org. That's where you need to send them. Also, you can head to our Zazzle store, our Zazzle store, It's where you find all sorts of twist goodies, twist goodies like mugs and shirts and hats and all those great things. You just click on that Zazzle link. It'll take you over to the store. A portion of the proceeds do go to supporting This Week in Science. And you get a cool cool piece of merchandise out of it. Support the show. Get some neat merchandise. That's right. There's some great stuff there. Christmas is coming up soon. I know I said that. I said the word. It's coming. If you need wrapping paper, we have Blair's Animal Corner wrapping paper on our Zazzle page. Go check that out. Also, you can click on the Patreon link. That Patreon link will take you to our Patreon community where you can choose an amount of of whatever works for you between a dollar to a hundred dollars a month to help support us so you become a member of the twist community anything above ten dollars a month and we thank you by name on the show twenty five dollars a month and we'll send you a t-shirt and there are also other levels where we will send you original art from blair's animal corner calendars and again the calendars are coming out and so maybe there's going to be a special offer for some of those levels for people who might want to Uh, get their calendars, and support us through Patreon. Whichever way you choose to support us. There's also a link, a big yellow donate link, that will allow you to give a one-time donation through PayPal. Uh, So if you're interested maybe in helping Blair buy buy a new computer, which we need her to do, uh, then you can click that YouTube, not YouTube, bloop, bloop, You can click that Patreon link. Nope, wrong one. Bloop, bloop, that yellow one. That's the one, PayPal. You can click that PayPal link and give a one-time donation of your choosing so that you can help us get Blair a new computer. Thank you for supporting Twist. Thank you for being a part of our community. We couldn't do this without you, and we would love to keep bringing you Twist. Thank you. And we're back with more This Week in Science. Yes, we are. Oh, and it's that time of the show that we like to call This Week in What Has Science Done for Me Lately? Lately. What has it done? Oh, we got a letter about chickens. Minion Sarah Crawford writes in this week, Independent. Pendants for chickens is what science has done for me lately. The lovely feather babies slash pet dinosaurs commonly known as chickens that I have living in my yard have been greatly impacted by physics and electricity. In the past, I faithfully trudged out to their coop at 6 a.m. every day and made sure I was home before sunset to let them out or lock them in their coop. However, I knew someday I would like to sleep in again on weekends. (laughs) That's parenthood or chicken parenthood for (laughs) you. I consulted with my brother, who is a mechanical engineer, about an automatic door opener for the coop. Eventually, I found that such a thing already existed and was able to fully automate the chickens. Their door closes 
Their door automatically lifts in the mornings and closes in the evenings. Of course, I still make sure to go out in the morning and evenings to give them treats, but I'm no longer bound to a strict schedule. It has been wonderful. Also, I would love it if Blair did something on tapirs. I love them. They've been my favorite since I was a kid, and I believe they're endangered. They are the gardeners of the rainforest, and they have the cutest spotted babies. I heard that scientists are now putting reflective strips on their trackers to help them be seen by people at night as many of them are being hit by cars in South America. So way to go, science, for looking out for one of my favorites. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for automating your chickens. I'll keep an eye out for taper stories. My yeah. favorite thing about tapers is that since they they live in the rainforest at the bottom of the rainforest, and there's all sorts of roots and leaf litter and stuff, that they lift their legs up really high when they walk. Um, and so if you when they live in a zoo, you'll see them do the same thing. They lift their legs really high when they walk, even though they don't need to. It's amazing. Hey, but uh, they don't. Uh, do you ever go, hey, tapers, you don't need to do that you anymore. You don't need to do that, bud. Quick uh, side question there, Blair. Uh, how much automation is there in the zoo in terms of feeding and that sort of thing? Or is it all zookeepers all the time? That is a very complicated question. The long and the short of it is that if you're trying to train animals to be practitioners of their own health care, then it's beneficial for you to be the, the person doing all the things. But when you have animals that are going to be released into the wild at some point and you don't want them to become used uh, to humans, yeah. then automation is huge. Like you'll, um, mm. you'll have a machine dispense food so that they don't associate humans with food or you'll have a machine open and close doors. So um, it depends on the situation, but it's absolutely part of the game for sure. Yeah, but then they're wa aren't they them wandering the wilderness going, where's the vending machine? <laughs> Not if you hide it really <laughs> well. Okay, so that answer that. So it depends on whether or not this is going to be a released animal or something that's going to be zoo bound forever. Okay. Yeah. 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 And then there's other things like um, there's this thing uh, that's a giant uh, kind of feeder ball, but it can be controlled from a smartphone. And so you can also have it dispense treats at random times to keep them interested as a form of enrichment so they don't come to expect it at certain times of day if like you're on the other end of the zoo and you can just hit a button and it'll dispense treats so there there's some for sure you could be anywhere with your yeah. phone zookeepers yeah. out on the town yeah well actually with their, they with have their zookeeping app now. they have they have these little things that are treat dispensers that are also a camera for dogs or you're not at home so yeah, you know, we can automate everything. But yeah, there should be some logic behind it. And Sarah, thank you for writing in. And we'll see if we can do something on tapers. That was a pretty good factoid about their legs and their walking. I like yeah, that. Yeah. So when you're working out and you're doing your high knees, just I'm a taper. About taper. I'm a taper. I'm a taper. <laughs> high knees like a taper. Okay. For more fun like this, you need to send us letters, emails, sonnets, haikus poetry, whatever it takes, your notes, your messages of what has science done for you lately, let us know. Let me know. Send me an email, Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. Or you can leave a message on our Facebook page. Just go to This Week in Science on Facebook. All right, Justin, tell me a story. So uh, past morphological analysis of fossil teeth has suggested that uh, the shared ancestor of humans and Neanderthals uh, may have lived more than 800,000 years ago. However, studies that have used DNA to calculate how long ago these two types of humans split from each other uh, estimated that this would have taken place around 400,000 years ago. It's quite a difference of result between the two, and is often the case morphological evidence uh, has been getting overruled by DNA evidence in the minds of many because morphological practices, the study of how things look in comparison to other things, while handy before hard science could be applied, relied way too much on human interpretation and was therefore often heavily flawed in a lot of categories of, of identification. So, uh, how to resolve this now that evidence of a Neander occupation of northern France has been discovered 
to be dated to over 650,000 years. Findings of a team of scientists from CNRS, the Musée National de Histoire Naturelle, uh, have, have found a site. Uh, it's actually located in the gardens of a housing estate in <laughs> a place called Abbeville. It was rediscovered a few years back after uh, 150 years of sort of being ignored. Apparently, this site was discovered once, and then, eh, well, just we, we were going to build houses here. We'll just ignore the bones <laughs> that are in the ground. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So, but they found more than 260 flint objects, uh, including five uh, hand axes that dated uh, from 650 to 670,000 years ago. And it's in the, this is in sandals and gravel deposited by the river Somme, uh, around 30 meters above the, the current valley. So finally, after a decent losing streak, put a win in the morpho uh, morphology column, uh, but specifically tooth morphology, which we have covered a few times. Uh, the, the evolution of teeth has timelines in it that <clears throat> apparently are, are proving to be more accurate than our analysis of uh, evolution of DNA and mutations that take place over time in DNA. Uh, and there have been quite a few different stories about Neanderthal tooth morphology over the past few years that have been pushing this date further and further back by finding these sort of uh, transitory stages of teeth and ever more primitive versions of teeth that they could tell would later turn into and be the foundations of the Neanderthal tooth. So 650,000 years uh, oldest site in, in Europe, I believe, uh, or at least in Northern Europe uh, for, for Neanderthals, pushing back their history and overriding our DNA evidence, which then calls into question how that was uh, initially initially come they, and, and there is there is something that that there is a suspect of bias in hmm. that we had our archaeological evidence of of that region uh of, of neanderthals at one point being stuck at around four hundred thousand years or so uh and the fact that the dna sort of matched that uh it tell, that tells a nice story but now it's getting all messy yeah, it's getting messy because I, you know, the, the, there, there were like, as in anything, there's likely outliers. And you say, well, these are too far out of the data set. You know, sometimes those, those, those uh, outliers in your data set are clues uh, and, not, <laughs> and not just bad data. So Especially when it's a small data set. Yeah, right. We're only right. talking about what we, yeah, what little DNA we can really extract from uh from neanderthals uh even using our our human uh we have human to go back a ways and sort of predict when that might split might have happened but on the neanderthal side you're right it's it's a very limited amount of information so what's the what's i learned in stats the p-value there is really terrible <laughs> You know, and based on a small sample size, it might have just looked really good. It might have been solid. You know, uh, the the if 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 there wasn't enough, uh, well, but anyway, it doesn't matter now because archaeology has backed up morphology, uh, and now we have a really strong argument for a much longer uh, period of, uh, of of time that Neanderthals not only existed separate from humans. Uh, but also uh, already 650,000 years ago, already in Europe, already with tools, tools that we uh, know largely originated, you know, million years before in Africa, uh, mm. made their way uh, into northern Europe in the hands of Neanderthals. That's cool. Keep digging, archaeologists. Keep doing your gene sequencing, genetic archaeologists. I want more. Let's get this data. Uh, speaking of genes and sequencing and doing more and more more samples and tests, mm -hmm. some researchers out of Stanford University and University of California, San Francisco, may be on the track to curing the common cold. <gasps> yeah, and more, and more than the what? common cold. More? There's yes. more? Yes. 
Where so will right... I get my cherry lozenges when people don't have colds anymore? Once <laughs> I don't need them anymore. <laughs> no, I, I don't. I don't need them because I need them. I like them. <laughs> you like them because they're cherry flavored and delicious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So, um, non-influenza upper respiratory infections usually come from uh, viruses like rhinovirus infections. Rhinoviruses are related to a group called enteroviruses. And these researchers publishing in Nature Microbiology, this week they found a way to stop a broad range of enteroviruses, including rhinoviruses, kept them from replicating inside human cells in a dish, in culture, and kept them from replicating in mice. And the way that they did this is pretty cool. They just process of elimination. So they started with a bunch of cells, uh, these human cells, and each little sample group would have one gene turned off and they would expose them to enteroviruses and figure out whether or not they got infected. If they survived, they'd be like, okay, what gene was that? Because that's the one that it, it didn't let the, the virus in. The virus couldn't interact with the cell because that gene was missing. So the process of elimination went through just about every gene in the genome, turning them off and disabled all of these genes in the cells until they found a, uh, a very specific gene that encodes an enzyme called SET-D3. This gene, they discovered, was essential to viral success, but they didn't know a lot about why or even what this enzyme does. So this, what they ended up discovering, though, is that the virus interacts with a portion of set D3 that isn't essential for the function of set D3. So they were able to engineer, bioengineer mice that lacked this enzyme gene, set D3. They grew up apparently healthy and fertile, even though they were not able to produce whatever enzyme set D3 creates. And... They were, they never got infections from enteroviruses. Hmm. Nothing. Even when they took enteroviruses that cause paralytic and fatal encephali encephalitis and injected these viruses mm -hmm. directly into the mouse's brains, mm -hmm. they still did not get infected. Yeah, I thought you were going to say spray up the nose, but that's way worse. <laughs> it's way worse. Just here, we're going to put it right in your brain. <laughs> so I, I'm super on board with this. I think it'd be yeah. great to never get a terrible cold again. However, mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't help but be worried that there's some sort of unintended consequence. Title of the show today, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, as of yet, no unintended consequences because it's just been human cells in a dish and uh, mice. So uh, no problem. But as I mentioned... The part of this that's interesting is that the viruses interact with a portion of the gene that is not necessary for the genes, for the enzyme's function. And so when the gene codes for the protein for the, to make this enzyme, the portion of that protein that the virus interacts with, you could target that and still have the protein do its job. So the idea is that they'll target a smaller sequence of genetic information that's in that target range for the virus on the enzyme. And then you target that with like a nasal spray or with, you know, maybe an injection or something like that. But some kind of drug that you could deliver and it would block that portion of the enzyme, but the enzyme would still work. And so that's what they're thinking might might be a way to go about it. So, so I feel you like take your, for like you take <laughs> for <laughs> healthy people, for healthy young people, where being a cold is just frustrating, mm -hmm. I would be concerned. But if you think about immunocompromised individuals or the elderly or mm -hmm. the very, very, very young, colds can be bad. They can be potentially yeah. deadly. So in those sorts of cases, 
it could be a life changer. Yeah. I just get worried about it getting about everybody doing it. <laughs> Cause like, I don't want to get sick again. Being sick sucks. But like, if everybody does it then and nobody then gets their, their immunity, nobody gets their immunity. One strain of the rhinovirus figures out something else to attach to. And we're all just on the deck. We're all just. Well, root. yeah. So, so, so it's interesting what you're saying. So there is, uh, there is some correlative, or at least mouse study functionality of this enzyme in uh, uterine contractions, and in <laughs> litter size in mice. Uh, hmm. And so it works somewhere upon uh, creating smooth muscle tissues. Uh, and it shows up in a lot of tissues doing they don't know necessarily what, but it has. So, so it might be like, we've cured the common cold, but now no one can have babies. Right. That right. would be it's just a trade off. <laughs> that would be there, bad. That you would. It's not intended consequence. Well, and, but think of it this you'll never have to buy tissues again. Uh, so, so there, but if, if you can, as you're saying, uh, avoid uh, impacting the active site of mm -hmm. this enzyme. Uh, but yeah. find a way to, to prevent it from being targeted by the virus, then we may have uh, some. It's also interesting that, that it's targeting a specific en uh, an enzyme, that the virus is attacking this a specific enzyme that is also found throughout so many tissues in, yeah. in the human body that uh, that it has, you know, then we, we have also targeted sites then maybe for, uh, for fighting the virus separately. But... Uh, yeah, that's a fascinating, that's a fascinating. Well, and my other question is, is a cold like your white blood cells going to the gym, <laughs> right? Like if you, if you stop having low key benign mm -hmm. in, infections, whatever they may be, yeah. are you less able to attack the serious stuff so yeah. so i mean that's part of no. the hygiene the answer, hypothesis well, but, but, right? but part of it the part of the answer is no part of the answer is it's not like going to the gym i this is my I had the cartoon i have in my head it's more like we've put an apb out for uh, all points broadcast look out for this particular thing if this come you come in contact with this white blood cells go to work on it yeah uh it's cousin Oh no, he's slightly different looking. Let him go by. Uh, so, so there is there is an aspect of uh, right, but like if you if 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 this um, security system that you're you're using in your metaphor, right? Yes. Uh, don't ever have a drill, and they go a very long time without a response. Yeah. Then, then does that affect the response when the so, so there is there's still there is other something. viruses and there are still yeah. other things. This yeah. wouldn't stop everything. It wouldn't uh. cure everything. But the you know the problem with the enteroviruses is they they can cause some pretty uh, major uh, infections. And then rhinoviruses, well, well, they're usually pretty minor, and it's like oh, sinus maybe a sinus infection or a sinus cold. It, and they go away fairly sim easily. The rhinoviruses, they mutate very quickly. So mm -hmm. um, because they change so rapidly, you are never, you're just going to keep getting them. The chance okay. that you are going to be exposed enough to become um, immune, immune to everything. Yeah. Right. It's not going to happen. Yeah, but that's exactly the every... concern is that they well, evolve so quickly that if you think that you're going to be able to get rid of them, I feel like that's just hubris. <laughs> Yes. A little bit, but there is also there's there's two other things there. One is that there's a reason you get the flu shot every year. It's because it's a new flu and you're not immune. Yeah. It doesn't give you permanent immunity. The other thing is there is something to what you're saying uh, about um, having a heightened immune system, which is there's this uh, one off sort of uh, discovery when they were looking for the latest batch of swine flu. I don't know, five, eight years ago, whatever it was. And uh, in Mexico, there was one village where people got it and just were fine. Nobody died. Uh, and they just got over it like it was any other cold. And it turned out, they, they think the reason is, the well water of this village or this town had really high levels of arsenic, which means <laughs> the body was producing antibodies. It was like they always had an infection. So there was all of this mm -hmm. white blood. So, 
So when they encountered something, there's enough white blood cells to, even with mutations or anything else, to be getting signals and getting identification and targeting and attacking. Uh, so so there, is, uh, there is this sort of back and forth that goes on there. But I don't think um, if, you could, if you could prevent it from having a nesting site in the first place, uh, I think that's like about as good a, 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 an immunity as you could actually get better yeah. than the natural immune system. Yeah. And if there's like, I, I'm going to take my nasal spray in the spring for my allergies and I'm going to take my nasal spray in the fall for my colds and not get them. Thank you very much. I will do yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Tell me about, I, I, I don't even understand the words that you put together. Robots and... Of the late Neolithic, yes. Okay. But... Uh, so this has to do with the wealth disparity gap, of all things. What? Uh, <laughs> You're just throwing words in a hat and pulling the, them out at random I, I, now. I totally am. <laughs> and what's crazy is they, will, they might, hopefully, <laughs> all make sense at the end. Okay. So it's one thing. Uh, anyone on every, either side of wealth distribution is keenly aware of uh, and yet do nothing about is the fact that there is wealth disparity uh, in populations of humans. And they don't talk about this. We don't talk about this most because throughout history, being on one side or the other has had severe ramifications for even discussing it aloud. The wealth side doesn't talk about it because they don't want to appear wantonly posh. And the other side doesn't talk about it because they don't want to be placed on a skewer. <laughs> so, so how did this, the question is though, how did this happen to begin with? How did the peoples who were at one point coming together, they were hunting and gathering as these tight knit teams. And then they started doing agriculture and they had these communities. How did they get to the point of wealth disparity and othering here? Well, there's one event discovered in recent research that might have had to do uh, a lot with uh, late Neolithic robots as being the cause. This is uh, 7,000 ish years ago. Societies across the Air Asia began to show signs of lasting divisions between haves and have nots, sort of really for the first time uh, in, in the Eurasia uh, scenario, at least. Research published in the journal Antiquity Scientists chart prehistoric inequality and trace its economic origins back to the adoption of ox-drawn plows. The farming industry's automatic ro robots of the day. So Aha. according to researchers, it was the transformation in farming, the, the addition of these oxes pulling plows, that made land ownership more valuable and labor uh, less valuable. So uh, this is Quoty Voice uh, by Samuel Bowles, an economist at the Santa Fe Institute. Oxdrawn plows were the robots of the late Neolithic. Uh, they say, uh, saying that the oxen were a form of labor-saving technology that led to a decoupling of wealth from labor, a decoupling fundamental to modern wealth e inequality today. The effect was the same as today, growing economic disparities between those who owned the robots or oxes in this case, and those who whose work the robot oxen displaced. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is then Amy Bogard, who's an archaeologist or archaeologist based at the University of Oxford, who is also a professor at the Santa Fe Institute. The surprise here isn't so much that inequality takes off later on, it's that it stayed low for such a long time. For around 4000 BC, societies across the Middle East and Europe cultivated a patchwork of small garden plots. So it was your family or your extended family, uh, they would get together planting grains, lentils, peas, all sorts of little crops. You would harvest it by hand, you would dig the soil by hand, and, and there wasn't like a big uh, disparity. You know, somebody might work a plow a little bit better than somebody else, but because you had enough people working together in these different plots, eh, you kind of everybody grew about what could be grown from that land. Uh, outside of, you know, weather events or anomalies of this nature, people pretty much could produce similar amounts of wealth based on their actual physical work. 
uh, with the introduction of the ox, things began to change. Uh, so the labor became less important. You needed less people. There was less need to hire people or even want other people around when you're, you're, you could just run foxes, uh, foxes, oxes over your land <laughs> and do the plowing. Uh, you no longer le needed to be part of an intricate network. Uh, and so over time, there were more opportunities by these uh, who had ox pulling plows to gather wealth, then monopolize land, and they could produce more from the land, which gave them more wealth so they could buy more land. And it was sort of an effect that then went uh, on like, generationally. Uh, this, is, this is one of those things that then it becomes passed down and it grows within a group yeah. of people over and over and over and multiplies to the point where then you have severe othering and differential wealth. And you get countries and borders, and then people have armies and uh, there's revolutions. And wars. Yeah, it's but all I'm because of to... ox. It's because of the... oh. yeah. I mean, you have the oxen, and the oxen have the baby oxen, and you can you know perpetuate mm -hmm. the oxen across generations. You can perpetuate the plow across generations. You can have more land because of these things, mm -hmm. and make more food, and sell more food, and have more stuff. Uh, so. It's that ability of taking more of where the of the prime of, of wherever stuff comes from. So if you're an agricultural society and it's food, then it's land. Then you can have more mm -hmm. and you and you're the ruler and you own and, it. But what is it now and what does this mean for modern day, right? So people are talking about no 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 we're, the robots aren't going to take away all our jobs there's going to be new jobs it's going to be a new economy it's going to be new stuff so is there always going to be this inequality or will there be those new jobs in the new economy in the new things that will so there won't be spread it and, out and it's because it's because automation isn't just a manufacturing mechanical physical activity thing anymore right uh automation is now uh don't hire an accountant uh there's an app that does your taxes for you uh why would you talk to a travel agent when you can and it's almost not a profession that you can think of that you can't at some point realize yeah that could be replaced uh so everything so is replaceable everything is replaceable except um, us we're not oh, oh 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 i don't know i don't know yeah 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 oh us yeah that conversations Conversations yeah, yeah. will still be. That's what I mean. <laughs> this, humans. this in particular <laughs> situation with the miscommunication and the yeah the awkward silences, awkward silences and bad jokes. This is what I feel like. <laughs> this, this is, is what real. We still can hold on to. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you can't copy yeah. this. Which is why I maintain it, it's not that different from something that's going to be very hard to automate, which is teaching. Mm -hmm. Teaching is really, really hard to automate. People have already tried right. so many times. Uh, it's very yet. difficult because it requires a social, emotional understanding, which is also why you could go into like, oh, that's why so many teachers are women and blah, blah. But it requires a social, emotional intelligence level um, that uh, is going to be very hard to replicate in any other way. Yeah, but the, 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 I think the question, if we were going out against the infinite horizon of the next 50 years, uh, what are they teaching people to do? So so if, if we are a work culture, if, if society will continue right. to be a work based culture, what will people do uh, at a point where there's there's uh, ox that can pull plows better than us in every industry? Uh, it. it forces us either to just be like oh well we missed the boat and we should just all starve in the streets or um a sort of star trekian socialism where everybody doesn't have to worry about the basic necessities or, or like denmark i think you, you <laughs> become denmark. an ox mechanic <laughs> i think that's what it's about right, for right, all right. of the We're automation there will always be jobs exactly. working on the automation why is the tech so, industry so huge? or there will so, be no, more no. like people for, have been right saying there will be new questions and new new positions, and there it'll be. open up new. Uh, but I love new, how the answer to surviving robot domination is just joining the robots. We're Join gonna, the robots. Work for the robots. Make them stronger. Make them healthy. Make yeah. them better. 
<laughs> well, if it's not the robots that are going to take us over, oh. maybe the planet will just get destroyed by an asteroid. Huh? What a oh. That could happen. <laughs> Okay, I've got a couple of asteroid stories for you right now. So uh, there is an, a well-known, well-documented asteroid. Well, there was a, a large body out in the... Uh, out. It's called the El Condrite parent body. About 466 million years ago, something happened... And this giant asteroid, about 93 miles wide, it disintegrated somewhere between Jupiter and Mars. And these El Condrite asteroids are lots of the stuff that hits our planet today. And researchers just published in the journal Science Advances their look at a couple of different layers, strata within the crust of the Earth to try and time this destruction of this asteroid with a giant dust cloud covering our planet and leading to the cooling of the planet and an ice age that they say then eventually because it created new biodiversity zones and new biomes it jump started a bunch of the uh, the, the diversity on the planet so Really interesting study where they've looked at two formations of sedimentary rock in Sweden and Russia. They had have been looking at this for a long time, but hadn't really been able to set it all together. But the way that they recently they looked at this hypothesis, they uh, looked for space dust in Sweden and Russia in these uh, these rocks and. They were able to track down the dust in the rocks and determine that it did come from space, that these weren't just earth rocks, and determine that they were from this L chondrite. And so the timing in the strata lines up with a dramatic decrease in sea levels, a cooling of the planet, and a massive ice age that was triggered. Uh, and so the the scientists really think that what happened is 93 mile big object disintegrated, massive dust cloud came from that, surrounded our planet. It just between Jupiter and Mars, but it just spread stuff every everywhere. A bunch of dust collided with our planet and also ended up in our atmosphere. That dust in the atmosphere led to atmospheric cooling, the ice age, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in that dust was a bunch of tardigrades, tardigrades. from outside <laughs> of the solar system. And so they pooped out something that later became plants, and that's how life on Earth happened. No! Oh. I, was, I was right there with you, Blair. Yeah? I was right there with you. I was like, that dust is full of tardigrades. Oh, I love ah. that. That's awesome. Someday. <laughs> oh. Someday. Yeah. Well, the interesting connection that these uh, these researchers are making is not with tardigrades, but they're saying, hey, let's look at these geological events from an astronomical perspective. And is there a way that we can take these uh, these events and bring them together can we can we look at things that are happening in uh you know in astrophysics in astronomical events in our solar system um and can we use them to uh to to lead us forward and so the idea here is that this space dust in our atmosphere cooled the planet and when we're talking about uh global engineering uh for climate change mitigation he's saying maybe we should look at this and go hey this happened once before there was dust in the atmosphere and ice age we should take a look at this and see if it's something that it re if if it's something we really want to attempt so the researchers are looking at this also not just from the geological perspective but also going we should look at this from a future looking perspective as all as well 
But all that dust would also inhibit the use of solar panels, would it not? It would. Very Be likely. Problematic. It would reduce, reduce their efficiency for sure. Ooh. <laughs> for sure. Um, well, so if the cooling from the dust from an asteroid causing an ice age doesn't get us and climate change doesn't get us well maybe just a real asteroid will get us and we don't want that to happen so a group of nasa researchers international researchers from the european space agency and other space agencies had a meeting recently they just had a meeting last week to talk about details for a joint mission called ADA, A-I-D-A, Asteroid Impact and Deflesh Deflection Assessment. ADA is a pair of missions that are being designed to take a big half-ton chunk of metal, and it's just, they're calling it a spacecraft. I mean, it'll have to be, but it's just a big chunk of metal, and we're going to slam it into a near-Earth asteroid to see whether we really can change an asteroid's trajectory if we try. This sounds like a really bad idea. I'm going <laughs> to keep moving forward on this. Uh, the, but it's, but, it's, but, it's, but, it's, but it's, it's the plot of, like, so many sci-fi stories of how we survive, <laughs> like, like, that's a thing we have to do, isn't it? We have it, to. It, we have I don't know. We didn't make flying cars. I mean, just because well, yeah, Hollywood asks because, for it. Well, because people get decapitated when people park in <laughs> crosswalks, hit the crosswalk the right. But no, this is this is one of those things that I, I think that we've talked. The society has talked about. Like there could be a day when we when we identify a uh, near Earth object that's heading our way, and we just have enough time to try to divert its trajectory from wiping out all life on the planet. And then yep. we decide if it's worth doing that. And we would then want to have a plan of action. Yeah. Exactly. And Let's so that's it. what they're working on. Yeah. And they have identified a particular target. It is called 65803 Didymos. It is a binary asteroid. So it is one big asteroid that's being orbited by a smaller oh. moonlit asteroid. Oh, so and, baby asteroid. And so we're aiming for its baby. That's oh, what we're no! Doing. We're going to send our half... We have it coming. We have it coming now. If we kill a baby asteroid, of course, Mama Asteroid's going to come and kick our butt. Oh, we're at <laughs> yeah. the... Double asteroid redirection test. Uh... Did I... What? The double asteroid redirection test... Dart is what it's called. It's a big dart in space. We're playing darts. Uh, 16 months after launch, Dart will arrive at Didymus and crash into the moonlet at 14,700 miles per hour. The hope is that it will, you know, change the trajectory of the little moonlet, not the entire asteroid, but this is how we're starting our testing. So you're going to hit the baby and separate it from its mother? How Possibly. dare yeah, possibly. So, so, so yeah. I know that this is not how the title of our show got named today. Uh, <laughs> but the fact that we're bringing this story in the episode called Unintended Consequences, I think is going oh, to yeah. foreshadow a horrible oh, outcome. No. <laughs> uh, so Didymos, this binary asteroid, currently is not in a, uh, a, a an orbit or trajectory that should bring it in contact with Earth, Earth at any point. We hope that we do not change that. Yeah, that's that's what sounds scary. <laughs> accidentally <laughs> nudge it right into our. Yeah, we hope that path. they don't do that. You know, interstellar billiards. It's you know, eight ball quarter. You know, geometry is hard. Is the thing. <laughs> It's physics. Where's, it's all wait, good. wait a sec. But no, it's, it's not math. That. Where's it's Minnesota good. Fats? We got to get Minnesota. Is he still alive? I don't think he's alive. We need somebody <laughs> of his caliber to be like, no, no, no. You're putting too much English on that asteroid. Yeah. You need to. You're about to bank shot it right into the moon. Yeah. So this is uh, the beginning of our efforts. After DART, the European Space Agency is going to send their mission called HERA in 2023. It'll get to Didymos about five years after we've made our dart attempt. 
And it will take pictures of the impact crater and take a look close up at what happened to the asteroid after we banged into it. Otherwise, we're just going to be looking at it with telescopes and cameras on the spacecraft as, they, as they're coming at it. So this is an interesting one. This is definitely, definitely a story to keep an eye on as July 2021 pops into view and DART heads toward Didymus. Ba -ba -ba. Blair, do you have any quick stories? Yeah, speaking of moons, <laughs> cats That's do it, dogs do it, bears do it. They all use anal sex to what? secrete a chemical language. They use smelly secretions from sex. their anal sacs to mark territory and communicate with other animals. Anyone who, who has sacks. had... Anal sacs. Yes, anal that's correct. Sacks. Anal sacs. That's yes. Right. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for, thank you for clarifying. Sacks. Anyway, <laughs> uh, if you've ever taken your dog or cat to a vet, especially an elderly one, sometimes they have to express the anal gland. And it is... A sight and smell, let me tell you. But regardless, this stuff is used. Um, it's not a spray like skunks, but it is used to mark their territory. Um, and this coming straight out of UC Davis, Justin, so you can walk right down the street and talk to them about this study. Uh, they wanted to see what makes an individual have a very particular smell to their anal secretions. This is from the Kitty Biome Project that has now become the Animal Biome Project. And they obtained anal sac secretions from a single male Bengal cat. So this is a sample size of one volunteered by its owner to participate. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> they extracted DNA from uh, different types of bacteria and also took samples from the chemical odor analysis from their anal secretions. And they showed that um, A, the microbe community was not very diverse and it was do dominated by a small number of bacterial genera. But what is most interesting um, is that it does appear that the volatile chemicals given up by the bacteria were analogous to the anal sac se secretions. So 67 volatile compounds released by bacteria cultures in the lab, 52 of them were also found in those secretions. So it is the bacterial community, not the cat itself, that makes the sense that they use to communicate. So many questions. Why? <laughs> why are bacteria doing that? Why, um, why, and why? How? How does each individual have such a different scent when they share so many bacteria in common in their microbiome? Um, how do the microbes influence the scent in particular? So many questions from one Bengal cat's discomfort. Uh, okay, we obviously... Such a child. Um, so, we obviously so... need to study more cats. Cats, so I, dogs, bears. No, no, dogs. More so I, had a, I had a dog that we had to take to the vet every once in a while. And they were always like, oh, we can teach you how. And I was like, no. No. Yeah. Good. I would really That's prefer nice. an expert like handle this. Yeah. But they had to like go up there and put pressure on uh -huh. this. Yeah, and it's like scrub. yellow. Yeah, it's like a yeah. mustard color. Gosh. I didn't. I didn't watch. Uh, but yeah, cat, it was a thing that was like every few. I don't know, like three years or so. Like this yeah. would come up. Like the dog would be like walking funny. It's like what's oh, it's that thing. It's the vet yes. thing. Yeah. Oh my goodness! In other quick news for the end of the show, just to take it to something, end on a and on a big <laughs> note, we're going we're going to end with the biggest neutron star in the universe Ooh. has been discovered. This is pretty exciting actually. Uh this neutron star may only be a measly 30 kilometers in diameter, but it's about 2.14 times the sun's mass. That's pretty big. This is the biggest that we've seen. And now what does it mean that this is the biggest that we've ever seen? Well, neutron stars, if they get bigger than a certain threshold. Oh, they collapse again into... Black holes. Yeah. Yes. 
So neutron stars may be the densest objects that we can see in our space. Uh, but if they get bigger, they get, if they hit a certain threshold, yes, they turn into black holes. And so seeing the biggest neutron star that we can see is pretty exciting because we may never see one bigger. And probably not in our lifetimes, but this neutron star may yet become bigger. It happens to be in a binary system with a white dwarf, which is not incredibly massive, but it has about it about quarter of the sun's mass and that's if and this binary system the white dwarf and the neutron oh, this star could be really fun yeah they're orbiting each other and the way that we've been looking at them is the radio signal from this neutron star which also happens to be a pulsar it's pulsing this is, it's a millisecond pulsar and it's giving off these radio signals in very rapid succession but because of the gravitational field of the white dwarf and because of the stretching and bending of space-time because of that, we've been able to identify some interesting aspects of this particular new neutron star based on its radio signal from this uh, that it's sending out. So there's some really neat stuff going on here uh, in this little system, this white dwarf, this neutron star. And maybe this, maybe this white dwarf and this neutron star may yet merge into each other. And result and, in a black hole, right? Because I don't, I don't understand how far away or how close the threshold is there. But it's close. But it's, it's the biggest like neutron right... star ever. It's closer than any neutron star we've ever seen. So therefore, it might not take much more to go over that limit. And then, wow, what is, what is the witnessing of a formation event in a black hole yeah. of this nature? That would be really fascinating. And you're That'd right. Cool. We probably won't live long enough to see it, uh, Kiki. But Blair will, because Blair's going to be a head in a jar. And an yeah. AI could be, she's going to live forever. Living forever. So she will see it. And you're going to have to just resuscitate our neurons long enough to give us the answer. Sure. Yeah, thank you. All right. Sounds good. I hope everyone here is resuscitated by all this wonderful science. We have come to the end of our show. We've hit all the news for this week. Uh, sad times, but oh, we'll be back again next week. I would love to give my shout outs right now. Thank you to Gord McLeod for helping out and managing our chat room. Thank you to Fada for managing our show notes, our social media, and uh, taking care of that YouTube chat room. I would also like to thank Identity4 for recording the program. So we have an audio podcast to send out. And... I would love to thank Wall Street Tech for his donation over on YouTube. Thanks for that. And thank you to our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Paul Disney, Andrew Swanson, Craig Landon, Andy Groh, Ed Stupolik, Philip Shane, Ken Hayes, Harrison Prather, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Richard Porter, Mark Mazaros, Jack Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill Kay, Bob Calder, Time Jumper 319, Eric Knapp, Richard Brian Condren, Dave Neighbor, Donald Bundes, Sarah Forfar, Dan Kay, Matt Bass, Darwin Hannon, Part Patrick P Pecoraro, Ben Bignell, Jean Tellier, John Gridley, David Williams, Corinne Benton, Adam LaJoy, Sarah Javis, Rodney, Tiffany Boyd, John Bertram, Mountain Sloth, Seth O'Gradney, Stefan Alberon, John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Paul Ronovich, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Noodles, Kevin Reardon, Christoph Zuknarek, Ashish Pants, Ulysses Adkins, Artyom, Rick Ramis, Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Slazuski, Jim Drapeau, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Steve Leesman, Kurt Larson, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie, Gary S., Robert, Greg Briggs, Brendan Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Luthen, Matt Sutter, Matt Kessenflow, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, and EO. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. If you, you right now, you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at twist.org. Click on that Patreon link or go directly to patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Remember, you can also help us out by telling a friend about Twist. That's right. Have you told someone about Twist today? On next week's show, we will be joined by a science comic book artist. He's writing a comic book for chemistry. We're going to talk about the art of science and communication. It's going to be a lot of fun. And once again, 
will be broadcasting online 8 p.m. Pacific time on twist.org slash live where you can watch the show live and join our chat room. You can also find us on our YouTube channel and join that chat room. But if you can't make either of those things, don't worry. All of the past episodes are available at twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have a mobile type device, you can look for Twist, the number four droid. Is that a thing still? I don't even know. I don't <laughs> think that's a thing. So just Google us or look anywhere in the Apple marketplace. -y. For more information on anything you've heard here today, like if you want to see how, how to spell ASP, for example, show notes will be available on our website at www.twist.org. While you're there, you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in your subject line. Otherwise, your email will be, where is it, Blair? Spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you tonight, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, please, please remember. It's all in your head. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. Jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got the eye Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you learn anything from the words that we've said then please just remember it's all in your head cause it's this week
week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 Yes, I exaggerate a lot. He's an embellisher, eh? Embellishment, yes. Thanks for watching, Daniel Yount. Thanks for watching, David De Silva, everyone. Ooh, Eric Hello. and AK was in Seattle last week and visited oh, Woodland Park Zoo. Nice. We're we're gonna be in Seattle. I'm definitely going to that zoo. Yeah, we will be in March. February. February. In February. I'm supposed to. Oh, Blair! I'm supposed. Mm. To, no, not yet. I'm gonna supposed to be going and teaching a uh, science communication for science teachers workshop at the mm. National Science Teachers Association meeting in Seattle in December. Mm. I was like, I, I said, yeah, I'll do it. And now I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing, so uh -huh. I, have to, I have to put something together. That's fun. <laughs> It'll be Can fun. Can I come? I've I've taught a workshop at NST I before. I've been to Seattle in a long time. Yeah. I want to go to Space Needle. I've so never I'm been to Seattle. Sure. Um, so? On the Space Needle, I saw this in the oh. article Prince for Zombies. This might still be true. I don't think it's true still, but like it might still be there. But there was um a Plants vs Zombies note, like with a zombie holding a note on the top of the Space Needle. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, I, actually, that that I, I I don't know if it's still there. Might not still be there. I want to see it for myself. Mm, I That'll don't be know. Hard. I don't know how I can see that for myself. I don't know. Well, we could take a helicopter. But that that no, that wouldn't work. We could borrow a helicopter. Yeah, that would be we could borrow a no, we could but steal we'll go, a helicopter. Yeah, so we're going to no. the we're going to the AAAS meeting in Seattle. In, it's around. February? Valentine's Day, February fourteenth oh, no. ish. I don't know what days exactly. We'll be figuring it out. That's soon. what I just wrote too. Identity Four just asked. I was like, yeah. I think around Valentine's yeah, Day. Yeah, around Valentine's. We'll be up in Seattle. It'll be fun. It'll be cool. It'll be a, f a fun, a fun trip. Twist is going to be doing a live broadcast from the <laughs> conference, which will be fun. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, Shnago, Space Needle doesn't actually go to space. Fake! Yet. Fake news! Yet. 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 We're still working on it. It's a work in progress. That wasn't that bad. Is that it's where the space elevator is going to take off from? I feel like it's got to be, right? No. No. Nope. No. Uh, nope. Nope. It'll... Nope. Nope. What if they actually build off of the start of the Space Needle and build it even higher? Yeah. That's so you've cool. already got some vertical space. Why waste it? Oh man, uh, Identity has, Four is going to Disney World. It 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 it, it, so, so, it happens to be a thing where when you build a space elevator, uh, you want it in the a least populated density below the space elevator in case things go a little wiggly wonkily. 
Yeah, like and a you mean in case in there's the unintended the consequences? Would they take forever to get to the island, and and there would basically just be a lot of people made off, of, and they'd have normal names like Brian. Oh, <laughs> I just thought of that. <laughs> I don't know oh, why. Right. <laughs> okay. The normal names. <laughs> yeah, it's you know the it's just because everybody has the same baby book that they're working off, baby name book that they work off of. It's it's bound to happen. It is not actually. I mean, from Men in Black, maybe. <clears throat> yeah. Um. Yeah. Men in Black. I. So in Men in Black, um, I think like there's something that looked like the Space Needle that actually had a UFO for the top. There was actually mm -hmm. UFOs on the top, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Blair's super not feeling well. Oh. Yeah. Oh, but however, however, I think we are. I think Blair, we are gonna head out soon. We are going to. However, uh, did yes. uh, maybe I missed it because I was away for a bit. Did no. Blair ever explain the amazing no. shirt? Oh, Her shirt. Tunic. Yes. Please explain your wearing. tunic, Blair. Okay. So <laughs> this is tie-dyed in indigo. So indigo is a time-honored tradition in um hippie and also witch culture <laughs> where you take natural indigo um and you add in soda ash and a reducing agent like theox you mix it all in you stir in one direction it can be clockwise or counterclockwise but you don't go back the other way you stir one Why direction you go the other way because it'll disturb the particles so you <laughs> What? So you have to go in one direction. It's witches, I'm telling you. So you have to stir in one direction, and yeah. then uh, you have to stir for at least five minutes, and then you stir out to the edges of the bucket or receptacle, and then slowly pull it out, and then you cover it, and you wait like at least twenty minutes. Um, if you get like legit indigo made out of flowers, I think you have to wait like a week, but. I used some chemical-y stuff. So you wait like 20 minutes. Then you open it up. There's a flower in the center, which is, it's like a bubble, it's like a bubble mass in the center. All of the surface of the water around the edges is like oily and weird looking. And then you pull aside the flower and the skin. It's an oily skin on the top. And it looks kind of like greenish, the water. So then meanwhile, you've taken your white garments and you have wet them with warm water. You've squeezed out as much of the water as you can, and then you've um, tied it up in whatever way you want. And then you have to s submerge it, but don't hit the bottom because there will be little particles of indig indigo dye at the bottom of the bucket. So you have to hold it just under the surface and agitate it. Um, in order to get the indigo into all of the bits of the fabric. Then when you pull it out and you squeeze out the indigo, um, it's bright green, the fabric. Bright yeah. green. Then it oxidizes. So you lay it out in the sun oh. and it turns blue. It turns blue, but not indigo. And what's... what's uh, indigo is blue. No, no, it isn't. So indigo is a fake color of the rainbow. The rainbow does not have the color indigo. And there was a legend. If you can, if you can't see indigo in a rainbow, it's because you are of low morality. So everybody well, claimed Roy G. Biv, it's rainbows. the eye. It, I know the eye in Roy G. Biv Wait, isn't so actually funny. there. It's a what? myth. Just no, it's not. There is What's no that? indigo between blue and violet. It He's messing with me because I'm no, colorblind. No, 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 no. It, it, you can Google it from color uh, All right. uh, able people. But the indigo in the rainbow doesn't actually exist. But it was a myth or a meme or of some sort in the ancient times where, where if you didn't see indigo in the rainbow, it's because you were of low moral standing. If it's the original uh, emperor wears no clothes. Uh, okay. Shit. There is no indigo in the rainbow. Well, anyway, <laughs> you let this sit out and oxidize under the sun for like 20, 30 minutes. Okay. Then you go back and you do it again. Um, uh, dip it and agitate it and all this kind of stuff. Pull it out again. 
Um, and basically, if I had just done that process, all of the space where it's light blue would be white. But then the last thing that I did is I opened it up. And when you open it up, you'll see a bunch of areas that are still bright green because they weren't exposed to oxygen or sunlight. And so um, by doing that for just like five minutes before I started to rinse it, that allowed the blue to permeate all of the white areas before I moved on. So it's very cool. I did this. I did two robes. Um, I did some uh, little baby onesie for my friend that just had a baby. Um, I did a scarf for one of my friends. So like I have a pair, I have a set of sheets that are indigo that I did for a previous one. It's just a very cool like color palette. It's very fun. It is fun. And it's chemistry. Mm hmm. Indeed. You got a redox reaction going on there. Yes. I love that. That is indeed like very complicated steps. It was complicated. Why is that so complicated? That's <laughs> chemistry. Chemistry is complicated. Yeah. That was probably I got lost. <laughs> well, I had the I had to print out the instructions, so I had them step by step ready to go. Traditional tie dye is a lot easier. You just soak your garments in um, hot water and soda ash, and then uh, you tie it up however you want, and you just spray it with a different color, different colors, and then wash it. That's it. <laughs> it's like very easy. Uh, but I like Sir Isaac process. Newton duped us into including indigo in our rainbow. Oh, it was, it was earlier. Newton, he's he discovered white light spectral makeup around 1665, observing white light pass through a prism. Uh, and he apparently, according to this story, the real reason is that he wanted to match the colors in the rainbow to the notes on a Dory in a Dorian scale. <laughs> 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 that's dumb <laughs> that is dumb I don't believe it but then uh, the other is that um, yeah yeah and the other is that uh, Newton had a history of dabbling in the occult and mm. um, seven is considered the strongest number the rainbow wakes up white light and made it sense to include seven number colors in the spectrum Dun, dun, dun. Color scientist. The eye is a lie. No, it's not a lie. Indigo's it's there. Lie. It's dark it's blue. Dark. It exists between 420 oh. to 450 nanometers. It's a tertiary color. There are primary colors, oh. secondary colors that are made by the mixing of primary colors. And then there are tertiary colors, which need all your primaries and ter secondaries to exist. And so indigo there are lots of other tertiary colors it's just indigo is the only one that hmm. we saw fit to put in the rainbow all the colors are in the rainbow all the colors are there we just only hmm. say indigo we don't really need to though but that's very interesting yeah indigo yeah indigo is well, somewhere it's between the there you go 420 to 450 nanometers <laughs> But color scientists typically pinpoint the divide between blue and violet at 450 nanometers, and that means indigo is simply dark blue, not its own color. Anyway. Anyway, thanks, you Newton. Go. You made thanks, our lives Newton. harder. That's fun. <laughs> we made an argument. Oh, he made a few. Uh, that was probably the least of them. Yeah, probably. Okay, we've heard Blair's story. All right, so that is means there... it's time to. Are you going to stay... be here next week, Justin? Uh, ooh, yeah. If if uh, yeah, most likely. Uh, you better I'll be. be. I'm not going to be here the following week. Uh, week I'll be there October. here the following week. Uh, next okay. week, if everything goes according to the finger cross plan, uh, I will be here and very tired. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you'll be in a different physical location, is what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. I, I'm coming down from the moon for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Come down to Earth, Justin. Yeah. Hi, in in two weeks, I'll be yeah. frolicking with polar bears. 
Yeah, that that's coming soon. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I thought that was November. That's nope. October. First week wow. of October. Oh my gosh. Nice. I can't wait. That's very gonna be very exciting. So cool. yeah. Blair's gonna go play with polar bears. Yeah. We hope yeah. she I'm doesn't so get eaten. Jealous. And by play with we mean in a buggy. <laughs> Look at them from a distance, separated yeah. by glass with and steel. Very thick I'm glass. Still yeah. <laughs> I am still jealous. Yeah, it'll be good. As you I've should be. Okay. Uh, say good night, Blair. And tigers in person. Yep. Good night, Blair. Say good night, Justin. Good night, Justin. <gasps> good, good night, night Doctor Kiki. Doctor Kiki. Kai. Kiki Kai. <laughs> Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode. We hope you come back again next week. Happy sciencing. Bye. Oh, yeah. Clicking all the buttons. <laughs>